Well, we are very excited as a church to uh, start this new series next week as we go through the life of David through First and Second Samuel. But before we start something new, we'd like to close something we've been doing uh, here the last few months over the summer as we've been going through the Fruit of the Spirit sermon series. Uh, each week we've been going through a different aspect of that fruit in its entirety, right? It's not one thing. You know, we don't each get gifted with a, uh, you know, I, I'm a very joyful person, that's it, forget the rest, right? Or I like to love people, but I don't like to be patient, right? It's one fruit of the Spirit with many aspects that we must exhibit as we follow Christ. So we're excited to close that out today. But before we begin, I'd like to read our, our scripture one last time in its entirety uh, that we've been studying in Galatians 5. So let me read that now as, as we begin, starting in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we come to the last week of self-control. It, it, it stands out as a very different aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Let me tell you why, right? Like if you have a, a new friend, like, hey, this is my friend Joe. Joe is very joyful to be around. We, we love having him. Oh, that's great. Maybe you have a new boyfriend or girlfriend. You're like, hey, this is my, my new boyfriend or girlfriend. He or she's really kind. Like, oh, that's so touching, right? No one introduces their best friend and goes, hey, this is my best friend, Jimmy. He is so self-controlled. You are going to love this kid. He's awesome. Like, bring him around the house more often. Man, his, his control is, is incredible. Like, it stands out, right? All the other aspects are nice and sweet and touching. But this one's just like, self-control? But I think there's a reason Paul concludes the fruit of the Spirit with self-control. And I think the thing that keeps us from seeing it in the way we should is we have a very earthly view, worldly view of self-control, right? A worldly view of self-control is, you know, if you were to Google it, it would say, all right, how to tame your desires, re resist the passion and urges that you get, and saying no. But I don't think that is what Paul is talking about here, because if that's what it was, I would often find myself in this situation daily tiring myself out, probably at times feeling defeated because I might not always win that victory when I'd rather be over here and join the Lord and having my desire be for him. So it's really not about saying no to your desires. Ultimately, I think it's about changing your desires. I'd much rather have my desires be on the Lord and enjoying him than being distracted and constantly over here. And, and we will be there. We will have to learn how to say no and 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 such, but willpower, I do not think, is what Paul is talking about here. Because often when we talk about self control, it's in isolation, it's all by itself. Like, let's just talk about self control. But if you see, what we're gonna see today is self control is never alone, it never acts alone, and we can hardly ever win it alone. But what we'll see is self control is related to the entire fruit of the Spirit in its entirety. I think that's why Paul concludes with self control, because it's not really about willpower, it's about wanting something more than yourself. And so what I did today is a little different. It's a, it's a little bit of a thesis statement I'm going for. Uh, I know they all don't start with the same letter or something cool like that, but this is what I got for today. Uh, Self-control happens when we live out the fruit of the Spirit in its entirety. Living out the fruit of the Spirit in its entirety happens when we value God above all, and we value God above all when uh, we know God, truly know God. So before we start, let's pray. God, we thank you for this series. We thank you for these last few months, Lord, diving into each aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, and how you displayed each and every single one of them so well, Lord. And may we strive to live this out in our own lives, Lord. May we see self-control in the new light today, and, and may we see that happen in our lives. Be with us today, and we pray this in your name. Amen. 
All right, so what we're going to do to to show you how related self-control is to every aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is I'm going to show you a point in the Bible where this is true. So if you lack love, you're going to lack self-control. If you lack patience, you'll quickly see self-control goes out the window. If you lack faithfulness, self-control is going to be a problem. And I want to show you that. So we're going to go through many different stories of the Bible, many different people, scripture. So I hope you can stay with me. Uh, I'll, I'll put it on the screen for you. This is how my, my, my mind works. It goes a little crazy and all over the place. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, so we're going to start with the first aspect of love. And we're going to see this in the life of Jonah. All right? Jonah was a prophet. He was called to go to Nineveh and to preach for them to turn away from their sin and to turn to the Lord. And what did Jonah do? Jonah was like, peace, I'm out. Goodbye, and he ran away. And then God got the biggest Uber driver that we've ever seen. Get him to Nineveh. And he did. And he did. Uber XL. And he preached. And you know what happened? The people actually turned from their sin. And they turned to the Lord. It was incredible. But this, is, this was Jonah's reaction to this taking place. Jonah, uh, Jonah 4, verse 1 to 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry, right? Literally, it's like, it was a great, great evil that what just took place. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That that is why I made haste and flee to Tarshish. He's like, that's why I ran away. I didn't want to see you show them grace. I didn't want to see you show them compassion because I knew you would because I know you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You see, Jonah lacked love for the people. God loved the people. Jonah didn't. So did Jonah have self-control when God called him to do something? No. He ran away. He said, no, I'm not doing this. I don't love these people as you do. No love, no self-control. And how often do we see that in our own lives? Right, the lack of love towards someone presents problems in how we treat them. We lose our self-control. Next, we see joy in the life of Paul, specifically before Paul knew Christ. And we read this in Philippians 3, 4 to 6, where Paul gives a little resume. His little LinkedIn accounts probably said something like this. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for the confidence in the flesh, I have more Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He's like, look at me and look at all that I've done. Paul's, Paul did not have joy in the Lord. He had joy in himself. His joy came from his strength, not from God. And we know if you don't know, Paul had a, had a problem with self-control before this, right? Persecuted the church, persecuted the Christians. He had robes laid at his feet as Christians are being killed. And you know what Paul did? Keep it up. I approve. Did not exhibit self-control and he lacked joy in the Lord, but joy in his self-righteousness. Next, we have peace in the life of of Peter. Oh, this one goes so hand in hand. If you want self-control, you got to have peace. The night of Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas is coming with the soldiers, and Jesus is there with a few of his disciples, Peter being one of them. And as this betrayal is taking place, as, as Jesus is getting arrested, Peter does not like what he is seeing. He is not peaceful with God's plan. He is not peaceful with what God has orchestrated. And because he did not have peace, what did Peter do? John 18, 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Instead of acting with self-control, he acted out of control. No peace, no self-control. Next, we have Abraham and Sarah. Patience. Abraham and Sarah said, you will have a baby I will bless you with the baby. And Abraham and Sarah said, okay. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And their waiting got old, and they got old <laughs> to a point where they were like, okay, I guess this isn't happening, right? So their patience ran out. And what followed when they lacked patience? Self-control. We see this in Genesis 16, 
Verse 1, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice, not of God this time, but of Sarai. So you see, when their patience ran out on the Lord, they said, all right, I guess we've got to do this our way. I guess we've got to take control and figure out a way to make this happen because I'm done waiting upon God. My patience on God is done. Let me figure this out on my own. Let me take control of this situation. How many of us have been there? We're waiting on God for something, a miracle. We're waiting for a situation to change. We're waiting for uh, some tension that we're experiencing at home or at work. We're just waiting. And eventually we're like, all right, I guess this isn't happening. And how do we react? Do we act with a self-controlled spirit or out of control? Next, kindness. Oh, this one is big. No kindness, no self-control. Let me show you why. Uh, Joseph's brothers uh, were, were overlooked because of Joseph. Joseph got this nice, sweet coat, and they're like, where's mine? He's the only one that got a present like that. We didn't. And because they, were, they, they felt that, they lacked kindness towards Joseph. And what did that make them do? Did they have self-control in their relationship with their own brother? They're like, no, let's kill him. No kindness, no self-control. But then one brother was like, hey, hey, let's not kill him. He's our brother. Let's throw him in a ditch and have him die that way. He is our brother, right? But then they're like, no, one step further. We can't. He's our brother. Come on, guys. And this is what we read happens. Genesis 37, verse 26. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let, our hand, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, guys. Come on. And his brothers listened to him. All right, because they were not able to treat Joseph with kindness, their control was so bad they were willing to kill their own brother. So your problem is not with self-control and saying no to passions and desires. It's the problem that you're not willing to be kind to people. The problem is you're not willing to be patient with people. He is our brother, Like, let's make some money off of him. Like, that's how bad their self-control was. That was the route they were willing to take. No kindness, no self-control. We continue, goodness. We see this in the life of Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus was not only known as this short guy who climbed a tree to see Jesus, but he was also known as a tax collector and maybe one who had a notorious view for making money in maybe not the best way. And we see that to be true in Luke 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. So here Zacchaeus is, is owning up to his, his unethical way of running his business. And because he cannot treat people with goodness, going a wrong route of his business was much easier. His self-control to make more money was just not there. It's not about his willpower. It was about his way of treating others with goodness that he, got, he can get self-control. No goodness, no self-control. And next we have David and faithfulness. And we, as I said, we're gonna go through this in the fall. It's gonna be a great study as we go through First and Second Samuel. So here's a little sneak peek as to a, a story that happened in David's life that showed us his lack of faithfulness made him act out of control. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse two. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. That's just problems in in one case. I don't even know what the architecture was of these places that led him to that place. That seems like it's a problem. But anyways, he keeps going, and he sees that the woman is very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent his messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. You see, David's lack of faithfulness to God, David's lack of faithfulness led him to act out of control. And not only did he forsake his own faithfulness, but he forsake somebody else's. Right? In this instance, in this event of adultery, it wasn't just David and his faithfulness that was at stake. It was somebody else's as well. And because he did that, he lost self-control because faithfulness was not on his mind. And lastly, we come to gentleness in the life of Moses. And I know Pastor Dave just spoke like an entire sermon on gentleness, and he gave Moses as this great example of somebody who had that. Uh, So I apologize, Pastor Dave, I'm going to poke at your sermon a little bit here, but he's not here, so it's fine. Uh, Moses was instructed 
by God to, to go to this rock and tell it to gush forth water. People were complaining, really bitter. I mean, this is like the entire story, right? They were just always upset, always complaining, and the Ten Commandments and the golden calf, and they're always hungry. Like, they're literally just kids in the back of a car this entire trip. Are we there yet? And this is how Moses reacts. Numbers 20. And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. You see, Moses was a very teachable spirit. He had a very teachable spirit most of his life, but there was one instance where he lost it, where he snapped, where he lost his self-control. And the consequences were severe. If you don't know what happened after this, God said, Moses, because you did that, you can't go into the promised land. So his one moment where he lost the, the heart of gentleness, the heart of being teachable, he lost his control and he did it his way. So now you see, if, if you want self-control in your life, you got to love people. If you want self-control in your life, it's not, it's not how to say no and discipline. That might be some aspect to it, but ultimately, it's about being kind to other people. It's about being patient with others. When you do these things, you will see self-control follows naturally. You know, so I can't just have one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. You have to have all of it in one. If you remember from our first week Pastor Dave used this quote by John Stott. He said, God isn't in the business of making lopsided Christians. It's not what he does. You know, another problem with self-control is it's, so, it's negatively viewed. It's almost mocked today, right? It has like this little bitter aspect to it, like, oh, I gotta so self-control. I gotta say no, because when we think self-control, we think diet, sex, binge drinking. Like, those are the things. Like, how do I say no to the second cookie? Like, that's not what I'm talking about today, <laughs> Self-control is done out of love for God. Self-control is done out of joy in the Lord. Self-control is done because we are faithful. We need to be faithful to God. But we have made self-control about ourselves, and that can quickly have us go down a, just a wrong path of, of self-righteousness. So the problem is that the reason we struggle with this, and the reason we struggle with living out the fruit of the Spirit fully is because we value something more than God. That's ultimately where our, one of our problems lie with self-control is in that moment, we're valuing something more than God. As we sang before, above all else, the highest praise, there are moments in our lives where we don't sing that. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, whoever controls you is your Lord, and that thing tells you you need this or you need that. So if we look back into the lives and the events of all the examples I just gave, we will see in each moment that person valued something more than God and they gave their control to that thing. And that thing said, you need this. You need this more than you need God. So let's look at that, each example. So Jonah, he lacked love because he valued judgment more. How do we know that? We read it. He's like, I didn't want you to do that. I wanted you to give them the punishment they deserve, but I knew you would be gracious to them. He valued judgment more than he loved the Lord, more than he loved people. That resulted in him losing self-control, ran away. Or Paul, he valued self-righteousness more than he valued God. All right, God, you're great, but look what I am great. Look how I am great and all these things I've done. Right, so he lacked joy in the Lord because he just valued his self-righteousness so much more than he valued God. Lost his joy, lost his self-control. Or Peter. Peter valued control. He's like, all right, there's this thing happening right in front of me and I, I can't control it. It's not how I thought this would happen. I never thought I'd see Jesus being betrayed. I never thought I'd see Jesus being arrested by soldiers. I valued my control over this situation more than I value God's. How many of us have come to that point in our life? I don't have control over this. If that bothers us, man, we will not experience much peace in our lives and thus no self-control. What about Abraham and Sarah? They valued having kids or the, or the status from having kids more than they valued God. They really, really wanted that thing and that thing said, all right, you don't have this yet, you gotta go get it. Even if it means doing it your way. So because they valued that more than they valued God and his word, what happened? They lost their patience. They lost their self-control. 
Or what about Zacchaeus? Probably know what he valued. He valued money. I value money so much that I'm willing to, to go about my business unethically, immorally, and, and cheating people to get that money because I value it so much more than I value God. Because he did, he couldn't treat others with the goodness of God. No self-control. Or David, he valued self-pleasure so much. He says, right here in this moment, I want to feel this with this. What happened? Lost his faithfulness. Lost his self-control. I'm telling you, self-control is tied in with every single aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. And lastly, Moses. I mean, I don't blame Moses. It, he probably got very irritated by this point by how complaining and annoying these people were being to him. And he just snapped. He said, I just can't take it. Won't these people just listen to me? And he just forgot about what God told him and just did it his way. His teachable spirit, the heart of gentleness, escaped. So you see, all these people valued something more than God in that moment. And that's how they lost their self-control. So where in your life are you giving your value to? Where in your life do you see that happening? I mean, look at this list. Do any of these even truly compare to God? Like, look at what route we're willing to go to because we just value self-pleasure. I just know this is gonna feel good. Or I just, I really need this status or these kids or, or, or control in this life. And we're saying that is more valuable than God? It's not even close. These idols are just so worthless in comparison to who God is. Yet we're willing to break down certain ways that we'd never imagine we would ever act because we need that thing. Amen. When that thing isn't the Lord, our self-control goes out the window. And, and why? How have we come to this place where God is somehow becoming equivalent with our desires, with what's true? And let me try to explain that out to you. In this book uh, by Carl Truman called The Rise and, Modern of, uh, Rise and Triumph of, Mo of the Modern Self. And there's something in there that he talks about called emotivism. I'm really not this smart. I'm just quoting. So the philosopher Alasdair MacIntyre puts it this way, very simply, Emotivism is the doctrine that all evaluative judgments, and more specifically, all moral judgments, are nothing but expressions of preference, expressions of attitude or feeling, insofar as they are moral or evaluative in character. Right? Nice, simple definition. You're all following me. All right. Or, Carl Truman puts it this way. He says, essentially, emotivism presents preferences as if they were truth claims. Or here, he puts it even simpler for people like me. Taste becomes truth. Taste becomes truth. Morality is simply a matter of taste, not truth. And then he closes it out with, it also means that those who shape popular taste become those who exert the most moral power and set society's standards. So you see, the problem is the reason we're not valuing God as to where he should be is we're being told we should value something else. And whatever that desire is that you have, that's who you are, and that's what you need. All right, like next week, we're getting football every single Sunday till February. I'm excited about it every single Sunday. But the problem is when you watch football on Sundays, you're not just watching football on Sundays. You're actually being told what you need in your life. Those commercial breaks are telling you, you need this, you need that, and we don't even know what's happening. And what we're being told is whatever your taste is, whatever you desire, that is what you need. And if it means breaking one of these fruit of the spirit aspects, that's okay, because that is what's true, is what you feel. Taste becomes truth. But the problem is the things, are always, the things that's supposed to be tasteful are always changing. Right, like, th just think about fashion, right? Like, all right, we're over this fashion. Let's go back to the 90s for a little bit and dress like they did. And then after a few years, like, all right, let's go back to the 70s. We'll wear that for a little bit. And, all right, it's always changing. It's never the same. And the thing is, I don't want to base my truth off of something that's changing. Truth doesn't change. I want to place my value on something that is always true, and that is the Lord. Amen. And the problem is that doesn't happen if we don't know the Lord. It's hard to, to value something we don't really know. 
We don't want to be trapped into this taste becomes truth aspect because, again, that'll change. What I want to place my value is the Lord. That's the only way. You know, there was, there was a pastor who shared a story about this guy that came up to him and said, you know, that was an incredible sermon. Everything you said about Jesus, that is so great. Uh, but before, before I dive in, I just want to go live a little bit and I'll come back. Like, okay, pastor was like, I guess you didn't really hear what I was saying about God and, and who he is and what he can do for you. Because if you did truly hear what I said, all those other things would just not even come close. Right? We see that in like our high school years, our college years. Like, all right, going to go enjoy life for a little bit and I'll be back. But it's like if we did truly know God and how great he was, wouldn't we want that instead of the desires you have to constantly say no to? And I want to give you an example of somebody who truly knew the Lord. And because he did, he could value God above everything. Because he valued God above everything, he could live out the fruit of the Spirit in every moment of his life. And we see that in the life of Daniel. So I'm going to quickly go through every aspect of the fruit and show you how because Daniel lived that aspect out, he had self-control in every single moment. So the first one in love, Daniel loved people. Daniel loved the Lord. Contrast to Jonah, who ran away, Daniel stayed. And this is what Daniel says in in Daniel 9, verse 5. It says, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. Later, he says, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, for we, notice how Daniel says we, Daniel, or Jonah said me, Daniel said we. He aligned himself with this sinful generation, said, I'm praying on behalf of these people. Jonah said, I don't like those people, I'm leaving. Daniel said, I love them, so I'm staying. He had self-control to follow what the Lord asked him to do because he loved God and he loved people. Next, joy. All right, Daniel multiple times, interpreted dreams. Different kings called on him, and and, and he was able to do those incredible things of of interpreting what what they meant. And unlike Paul, Paul said, look what I did. Daniel said, look what God did. We see that in Daniel 2.23. Daniel was interpreting a dream, and he said, for you have given me wisdom and might. Daniel's not taking credit. He's not saying, look what I did. Look how many dreams I interpreted. He's saying, this is all from God. Always was, always will. Because he had joy, he had self-control. Next, we have peace. Oh, this one is, if you want self-control, you gotta have peace. And we see this so true here. Uh, Daniel knew that there was a document being signed that said, if you pray to anybody else other than the king, you will go to your death, in the den of lions. All right, that was, a, that was a law that was passed. Imagine if that law passed here. What would our reaction be? Well, let me tell you what Daniel's was. It's incredible. Daniel 6.10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day, took out his phone, and, and went on social media and ranted about how terrible his government was. Uh, that's, not the, that's not the ESV. Sorry, one more. Uh, he, he got down on his knees and three times a day. He texted his group chats with all of his friends that think the similar to, similarly to him. And he just complained, what, what, what is this government doing? How are we, our country's going to hell. The NIV, sorry, all right, ESV says this. He got down on his knees and three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. That was his reaction to saying, if you worship anybody other than the king, you will go to your death. And Daniel said, okay, let me go do something. And these next five words tell you, as he had done previously. I'm going to go pray in response to that as I have always done. And the reason Daniel could do that, the reason Daniel had that self-control is because he had peace that God was still in control he had peace that God was still on his side. And the problem is, I remember years ago, there, there were some things in even our own government passing laws that weren't necessarily biblical, and we lost it. We lost it. Like, oh, how are, this country is going in a terrible direction. We're never going to be able to live here. I might move to, to Europe or something, although it's not much better there. So where am I going to go where I can have this peace because I really need culture and, and government and, and the society on my side? Daniel's like, I don't need those things on my side because I've got God. 
Because that is true, he had peace. And I'm not saying, you know, we shouldn't stand up for what's right. Like, we need to do that. Stand up for justice. Stand up for people not being treated rightly. And, you know, we support ministries that do that like first choice, right? They said, no matter what the government says, no matter what laws are passed, we are going to love women and their babies and treat them and care for them. Well, that's much different than what I described before. He had peace in God, so he had self-control. Or next, patience. This one's also huge, right? Daniel had patience that what the Lord told him would come true. He had patience in the Lord that he would eventually deliver him. And we see that as Daniel was in the lion's den. Right? Contrast to Abraham and Sarah who said, I'm done waiting. Let me do this. Daniel said, I'm never done waiting on the Lord. And this is what we read happen in Daniel 6.22. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you. O king, I have done no harm. So you see, I think the problem with us is our, is our, our patience runs out much earlier than Daniel's. All right, look at all these different steps it took for Daniel to get there. Step one, he's probably brought before the king guilty. And for us, that's where our patience runs out. We're probably saying, God, deliver me right here in this moment. Get me a lawyer from Jerusalem. Have him present an awesome argument. Set me free. A lot of us, our patience would run out here. Some of us, maybe we're on our way to the den, all right? We, got, we, could, we had some patience, right? Now we're on our way to the lion's den. We're probably like, all right, God, deliver me. Give me superhuman strength. Kill these soldiers. Set me free. Daniel kept waiting. His patience didn't run out. It wasn't until Daniel was sitting next to a lion when God chose to deliver him. You see, God's greatest glory is demonstrated through our greatest trials, Imagine if Daniel was saved before the king, before the lion's den. We would never have that story to tell. God's power and demonstration of his glory would have never been revealed if he never got to that point. And so many of us never want to get to this point. We never want the lion next to us. But I'm telling you, God is so much greater than that lion. It will never harm you. Be patient upon the Lord and you will have self-control. Or kindness. This one is incredible. This, like, I never really thought about this until I was studying this. Uh, as famous story, Daniel's friends were thrown into a fiery furnace to die because they would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what the king literally just did that. The king just threw three of Daniel's friends in the fire to die for worshiping the Lord. And this is how Daniel treats the king. Daniel 4, 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may be perhaps a, a lengthening of your prosperity. Daniel is like, hey, I hope you turn away from your sin. I hope you know the Lord. And I also hope you get to continue to, to be king. To the guy who just threw his friends to their death in the furnace, right? We'd be like, yo, get to the poles. Get this man out of here. He has no right to be here. I can't believe you did that to my friend. We would have... We'd quickly lose control over our tongues, our mouths, and what we would say from them. But Daniel, he's like, I gotta be kind. Therefore, what did he have over the words he said, the thoughts he had? He had self-control because he valued kindness. Or what about goodness? Daniel was very popular. He rose to a high level of status in the kingdom because of his dream interpretations. He very well could have used those things to, to cheat people, to gain money, to gain popularity, whatever it was. But we don't find that to be true. When they were actually trying to find Daniel guilty of something, to throw him in the lion's den, this is what they said, Daniel 6.5. Then these men said, we shall not find any grounds for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. And then when Daniel is in the lion's den, the king shouts down to him, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. No king would look down at a guilty murderer and be like, hey, I know you just killed someone, but uh, I hope your God delivers you. <laughs> like, that would never happen. The only reason the king said that is because Daniel must have been good. He must have been innocent. And then lastly, or two more, <laughs> faithfulness. Uh, you know, in Daniel 1, we see Daniel brought over to Babylon with many others, and they're, they're, they're being tested by eating all this food and getting prepared to present themselves before the king to seem healthy and and fit. And we read this when, when Daniel hears this in Daniel 1.8. He says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And then in 1.12, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
Daniel's like, hey, forget all the nice meat, forget all the nice wine, let us just eat vegetables. Like, that sounds terrible. Like, give me the carnivore diet over the vegetable diet. But did Daniel cave to his self-pleasure? No. He was faithful to the Lord. Therefore, he had self-control over his food. Lastly, gentleness. Daniel, as I've said many times, received many dream interpretations from the Lord. And Daniel ascribed it to the Lord and said, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. And we see this true in Daniel 7. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the vision of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all of this. See, Daniel is not quickly to say, this is me, this is what I think. He had the heart of gentleness, the, the teachable spirit. Said, God, what do you want me to say? It's always you, it's always going to be. So now you see how each fruit goes hand in hand. That is how Daniel was able to have self-control because he loved people, because he had joy in the Lord, because he was patient. Those are the reasons, the way he was able to show self-control because God was always at the center of it. But if you look at all the other examples I gave you, God is somehow is absent. Praying to God is absent. Worshiping God is absent in those moments. Right? Instead, they, they, they acted ignorant of God. They acted in rebellion to God, and that resulted in a lack of self-control. So as we close and we continue, continue to speak on this idea of self-control, I want to invite John up on stage as we prepare a, a song of reflection. But before we do, let me remind that, that self-control cannot just be willpower without God. Because when, when that is, we'll see that it often doesn't work. And the times that it does work would actually falsely lead us to believe that we can do it on our own. It could result in us having self-righteousness like Paul. Look what I did or it can make us actually doubt ourselves. If we keep failing to it, we might have a poor view of ourselves and not what God tells of us. You see, when, when I've tried to have the willpower and the self-control to overcome temptations and, and desires, and I've leaned on my self-control and willpower, I often never won. It wasn't until I threw my hands up to God in surrender and said, I can't do this anymore. I feel so defeated. That is when God said, you are free. When I gave up, relinquished control and gave it to God and said, I can't do this. As you know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life and the truth will set you free. Not your willpower, not what you think you can do, but I will set you free. So if you want to be set free, if you want to have self-control in your life, you actually have to let go of it and let God have it. You'll see freedom. You'll see you start valuing God above everything and you'll start seeing you living out the fruit of the Spirit in its entirety. Give God control.